it orbits the planet in the opposite direction of most moons in our solar system. This suggests Triton is an orphan captured and adopted by Neptune. An odd couple, a blue, gassy giant and a frozen, icy moon. At minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, Triton is the coldest body in the solar system. Here, ice is as hard as steel. The lines, hundreds of miles long and about 10 miles wide, are collapsed ditches. Smooth areas, possibly frozen lakes. And there are few craters, evidence of a young exterior being actively renewed. The black streaks come from the moon's strangest features. It's geysers. What we seem to be looking at here are geysers, some kind of gas, probably nitrogen, being shot up to about six miles high and then being blown at a 90 degree angle and then traveled many hundreds of miles, if you like, downwind. Dust falling from these jets form the strange black trails across the surface. This was the last body in our solar system seen by Voyager. It gave us wonderful glimpses of faraway places. The Voyagers were probably the most successful spacecraft ever constructed and built. Now, they weren't without their problems, but they did their job. But their job was merely to quickly fly past each planet, take a few snaps, and send the pictures back. They were designed to pave the way for the spacecraft that were going to visit each planet and stay there, become a natural satellite, go into orbit around the planet, just like Galileo. This craft was to be part of NASA's next generation of explorers. Designed in the 70s, built in the 80s, Galileo would pay homage to the largest planet. Jupiter, we think, is important specifically because we think it contains some of the same material that made up the original solar nebula from which all the planets in the sun formed. So if we can measure what the composition of Jupiter is, we think what we're measuring is what the solar system was originally made of. And that's a fundamental piece of information. Finally, in October 1989, the day came. We have ignition and liftoff of Atlantis and the Galileo spacecraft bound for Jupiter. Six days after launch, Galileo and shuttle parted company. But with no powerful centaur to take Galileo directly to Jupiter, a roundabout path was needed. Galileo would swing by planets and asteroids, picking up speed and direction with each encounter, winding itself up for the final slingshot. Instead of the original two-and-a-half-year trip, Galileo would take six years to reach Jupiter. But NASA took advantage of these flybys. The surface chemistry of the dark side of the moon was compared to the light side. Galileo also took atmospheric measurements of the ozone levels over Antarctica. But things were going wrong again. Just as the craft was leaving Earth for the final time, the high-gain antenna refused to open properly. The awful truth dawned on NASA. With the antenna stuck, Galileo was virtually useless. The high-gain antenna was really its primary communication tool with the Earth, which of course is hundreds of millions of miles away. And it was designed as a huge dish to send back huge amounts of data. And when the fault developed in the antenna, the great umbrella got stuck and couldn't open. For things which we think that there's some reasonable prospect might not go as we expect, we develop contingency plans. We developed no contingency plans for the high-gain antenna not opening because we were very confident that it would. But it never did open properly. Now, instead of sending back a picture every few minutes, Galileo would trickle out only enough data for one picture every week. But what is it about Jupiter, this huge ball of gas, that attracts all this interest? Jupiter's big. 
There's no place to stand. Tremendous jet streams in the atmosphere, satellites circling it, a magnetic field whipping around every 10 hours. It has a huge feature, the Great Red Spot, which is always intriguing. And uh, the storms last for hundreds of years. The Great Red Spot, a storm large enough to swallow the Earth three times over. It was all that most people knew of Jupiter until 1994 when the world watched 21 pieces of comet Shoemaker-Levy explode in its atmosphere. They were fragments of a comet torn apart by a close scrape with a giant planet two years earlier. Jupiter pulled the fragments into its clouds. These fragments disintegrated in huge explosions in the upper atmosphere. Afterward, Jupiter wore a few black eyes. Some expanded to the size of our planet. Explosions like this would devastate life on Earth. For Jupiter, they were no more than a bee sting. At the time of the Shoemaker-Levy impacts, the Galileo spacecraft was well on its way to Jupiter. Since Galileo's launch, computing power had mushroomed. Engineers could now compensate for the flawed antenna with a technique that compressed data received from the spacecraft, allowing pictures to be sent in hours rather than days. You're welcome. Some impact pictures trickled back to Earth. But just as it seemed Galileo was recovering, another calamity stopped the hearts of the engineers. The tape recorder appeared to fail. Galileo was just two months away from its rendezvous with Jupiter. They eventually discovered one end of the tape was faulty. By ordering the onboard computers to ignore that portion, the rest could be used to record pictures and data but there was a price to pay. Galileo's route was planned so it would encounter Io, a cauldron of sulfur volcanoes, and one of Jupiter's most intriguing moons. But the fault with the recorder forced a shutdown of the cameras. Galileo flew blind past the moon. Galileo seemed jinxed. An expensive trek to the Jovian system was being dogged by failure. Galileo was actually two craft. Some months earlier, a probe had been sent from the main craft. The main craft would go into orbit around Jupiter, while the probe would plunge into the Jovian atmosphere. It was a one-way trip to vaporization. December of 1995, and the probe's about to have its 60 minutes of glory, zipping as much information as it can back to the orbiter before being fried. The probe entry into the atmosphere is the most difficult planetary entry that we've ever attempted. Uh, the probe will hit the atmosphere at 106,000 miles an hour. That would take us from the west coast of the United States to the east coast in under two minutes.